Thank you, Monica. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rene Shellhas. Uh, Dr. Shellhas is a clinical professor of pediatrics um, at the University of Michigan, where she holds uh, the Donita Sullivan Research Professorship and serves as the Director of Research for the Division of Pediatric Neurology, as well as the Associate Chair for Career Development for the Department of Pediatrics. She has served on the Child Neurology Society Executive Committee, American Academy of Pediatrics Section on Neurology Executive Committee, and is the co-chair of the American Epilepsy Society's Research and Training Council. Her work on neonatal seizures include discoveries regarding the genetic basis of uh, neonatal epilepsies and optimal treatment duration for acute symptomatic neonatal seizures. Over to you, Dr. Shelhas, and thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here, and I have to pinch myself for being allowed to speak um, after Dr. DeVries um, and the other outstanding speakers uh, today. Um, so thank you for sticking it out all the way till the end of this outstanding symposium. I'm really excited to talk with you about some new developments in research in neonatal seizures. These are my disclosures. <laughs> Importantly, um, there aren't uh, FDA approved medications to treat neonatal seizures. So we're doing a lot of, of work uh, off label. I wanna begin with my thank yous. Uh, the work that I'm gonna to present to you comes as a result of really outstanding collaboration uh, with individuals across the United States. I am privileged to work with Dr. Hannah Glass as the co-principal investigator of the neonatal seizure registry. Uh, and these are our colleagues at each of our nine centers. Additionally, uh, at the Neonatal Seizure Registry, we have found that parent and stakeholder input is really essential. And we have a parent from every study site who advises us, as well as representatives from parent advocacy organizations who have helped with our study design, uh, recruitment, retention, interpretation of data, and writing of our manuscripts. I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of some updates talking about evidence for first-line treatment talking about evidence for stopping medicines, risk factors for infantile spasms, and recognizing mental health concerns among parents of infants with neonatal seizures. We're all here because we believe that neonatal seizures are common and consequential. We recognize that babies with seizures have a high risk of mortality, and that survivors often, or perhaps usually, have disabilities, which could include cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, or epilepsy. Usually neonatal seizures are considered distinct from epilepsy, but we're making a case uh, to think about them in the context of the way that we think about other seizures in infants. In early 2021, the International League Against Epilepsy released their classification of seizures and the epilepsies with a modification for seizures in the neonate. This really brings neonatal seizures to the forefront. The paper emphasizes the key role of EEG for the diagnosis of neonatal seizures, emphasizes that seizures may have clinical manifestations, but EEG only seizures are very common. It took me a long time to get my head around this, but if we think about it this way, if the seizure does not begin in the motor cortex or evolve to in, in, involve the motor cortex, the baby isn't going to move because of the seizure and the preverbal infant isn't going to be able to explain a sensory phenomenon associated with the seizure. So EEG only seizures are very common. Importantly, events that do not have EEG correlate are not seizures and, and don't need to be treated as such. I recognize that many of you come from uh, institutions and regions where EEG monitoring is really a luxury that can't be applied to every baby. Um, I would refer you back to this paper uh, where they provide some suggestions of how you might uh, look at a baby that you're worried about and decide whether you are confident that they have or have not uh, had seizures. So now that we think about neonatal seizures, we have to think about how we might treat them. And you know, this title of this editorial, after all these years, we still love what doesn't work, uh, really still resonates. This editorial was published in 2005. And after this time, we still are using the same medicines. Phenobarbital remains the first line treatment for neonatal seizures. This has been true in cl clinical practice worldwide. It has been very consistent and has not changed over time. <clears throat> 
here are some data from the Pediatric Health Information System uh, representing treatment for more than 6,000 infants from nearly 50 North American children's hospitals over a decade of time. And you see on the top that among babies who are treated for neonatal seizures, more than 90% receive phenobarbital. Over that decade, there was an increasing use of levetiracetam uh, with some babies still receiving phosphenitoin. Sadly, levetiracetam is not as good as we had hoped for neonatal seizures. The NEOLEV2 trial was really a beautifully and carefully done trial uh, examining, examining the effect of phenobarbital as compared with levetiracetam for EEG confirmed seizures as the first line treatment for seizures in newborns. <clears throat> what they found was that 80% of babies who received phenobarbital had their seizures stop for at least 24 hours. That's much more than the 28% of babies who received levetiracetam. Importantly, no baby who had persistent seizures after phenobarbital had resolution of their seizures when levetiracetam was added. So these data really suggest that levetiracetam should not be in our first or second line um, treatment pathways for neonatal seizures at this time. The best option really, as we begin to treat neonatal seizures is to make a plan that makes sense for our local institution, our local intensive care unit and stick with it every time because that way we'll have consistent treatment and we'll do the very best that we possibly can. For most of us, we should begin with a loading dose of phenobarbital. If at all possible, have EEG monitoring to help us to determine whether the seizures have resolved. And if they have, then um, our recommendation is to continue EEG monitoring until the baby has been seizure free for about 24 hours and to consider maintenance phenobarbital at least for a few days. And I'll talk with you some more about that in a little bit. If the babies have not resolved, uh, the seizures have not resolved, then again, continuing EEG monitoring if possible and adding additional phenobarbital um, to reassess. If seizures continue to uh, persist, then selecting the second and third line agents depends really on the clinical scenario and your local resources. Uh, I would refer you to this paper by Jennifer Keene, uh, which outlines a number of different institutions uh, practice guidelines for neonatal seizure treatment. The second line medicine and further testing for neonatal seizures really um, depend on etiology. We know that most neonatal seizures are provoked seizures. And many times those babies have subclinical seizures I just told you about. And usually we can identify an acute etiology. Most often it's HIE, maybe hemorrhage or stroke. Those seizures, the natural history is that they resolve within days. And there, at this point, there is not etiology specific treatment for the seizures. Contrast that with babies who have neonatal onset epilepsies. And this is encompassing between 10 and 15% of all neonatal seizures. Tonic seizures are very common in these babies. So for an infant who does not have an obvious acute etiology and they're having frequent tonic seizures, please think about epilepsy as the etiology. These babies may have coexisting um, acute brain injury, but usually they don't. <coughs> Importantly, most often babies who have neonatal onset epilepsies have an identifiable genetic etiology. Their seizures will persist um, and they're gonna need long-term treatment. And sometimes there is precision therapy that's possible depending on the genetic etiology. So this is a key distinction that I hope you'll all remember is that it's important to identify, does the infant have acute provoked seizures or is it epilepsy? And if it's epilepsy, Right away, think about genetic etiologies. <coughs> so we agree on how to start medication, phenobarbital for the most part, but how should we stop? In the neonatal seizure registry, we found that treatment duration was variable. There were really two schools of thought and practice. There was a group of institutions where most babies had medicines maintained at the time of hospital discharge, and the medicines were weaned at follow-up at around three or six months. This has really been the historical approach, and it represented about three quarters of the first 600 babies that we evaluated in the neonatal seizure registry. 
Then there was another group whose medicines were discontinued. The medicine was stopped after the acute seizures resolved, um, and this was backed by safety in some small studies. There was an attempt to, to do a randomized controlled trial uh, to evaluate maintaining versus discontinuing the medicine, but that failed due to low enrollment. People were nervous, um, both because they wanted their baby to continue on medicine uh, and they were afraid seizures might return and because they were concerned that the medicine may cause, cause harm and that resulted in low enrollment. There were about a quarter of our babies in the neonatal seizure registry uh, who had their, their medicines discontinued prior to discharge. So we developed a study that we called NSR2, neonatal seizure register, Two, and the objective was to examine the association between duration of anti-seizure medication use and 24-month outcomes among newborns with acute symptomatic seizures who were enrolled in the neonatal seizure registry. The NSR2 was a prospective observational cohort. We enrolled babies at nine centers across the United States. Every one of these centers has a level four neonatal intensive care unit and a level four pediatric epilepsy center. And we all follow the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society guidelines for neonatal EEG monitoring. We included babies who had seizure onset at less than 44 weeks postmenstrual age, who had clear acute symptomatic seizures, uh, most of them with HIE, stroke, or hemorrhage, but a smattering of other etiologies as well. And we excluded babies who had a mild transient cause for seizures, for example, uh, hypoglycemia with no brain injury on, on imaging, uh, who had clinical events that were determined not to be seizures. Importantly, we excluded babies who had early onset epilepsy, and we excluded babies who did not survive the neonatal admission. The primary predictor was going home with or without anti-seizure medicines. So we had a group who, whose clinicians decided to discontinue the medicine prior to discharge from the neonatal seizure admission, and then we had another group whose clinicians decided to maintain the medicine. The primary outcome measure was something called the WIDEA FS. This is the Warner Initial Developmental, Evalu Developmental Evaluation of Adaptive and Functional Skills. It's a tele telephone functional assessment uh, that was conducted by blinded um, clinical research coordinators. This tool tracks fairly well with the Bailey scores. Secondary outcome uh, that was pre-specified was the incidence of post-neonatal epilepsy. Uh, so babies may have had their symptomatic seizures resolved, but after uh, time had acute unprovoked, uh, sorry, had unprovoked seizures um, that began and they, so they had an epilepsy diagnosis. We used propensity scoring for the analysis. Um, just one quick slide on this. Uh, this is a statistical technique that uses observational data to estimate treatment effect by accounting for variables that predict the treatment. So what are the variables that I, as the clinical, as a, as a clinical provi provider at the bedside, might use to, to determine my decision about how long to continue medicines? The idea here is to reduce bias due to confounding, and it's a tool used to improve causal inference in observational non-randomized trials. We enrolled 305 babies. We had to exclude two. <coughs> Uh, 21 were lost to follow-up, three because they died. And we had 90% of our babies who had a primary outcome to analyze. Two thirds of the babies had their medicine maintained at the time of discharge. And most of those babies went home with phenobarbital monotherapy. There were a handful who had levotracetam monotherapy and another handful who had combination therapy with phenobarbital plus levotracetam. Not surprisingly, babies who went home on anti-seizure medication had higher phenobarbital exposure than babies who went home off of medicine. Uh, I want you to just pay attention to the overall treatment. So the median treatment duration for babies who went home off of medicine was six days. The median duration for babies who went home on medicine was four months. So quite a big difference. Here's another way to look at this with a Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, we see that, um, Overall, the median duration of continuing treatment was four months. We had 40% still on medicine at six months, 20% still on medicine at 12 months. And that wasn't because they necessarily had epilepsy, they just continued their phenobarbital from the NICU. 
The unadjusted results are presented here. Um, and Dr. Curtin showed you some of this already, uh, but I'm gonna reemphasize it because I think it's really important. What we have here is a box plots of the WIDEA, the functional development score at 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months. In the purple, the babies who maintained their, their medicine at the time of discharge. In the gray, the babies who went home off of medicine. And you see that these box plots are really very much overlapping over time. There was no difference in the primary outcome. When we looked at uh, the risk for impaired functional development as defined as a WIDEA FS score of worse than two standard deviations below um, the normal mean, uh, at age 24 months, there was no difference. Uh, about a third of babies had functional impaired functional development at two years of age. In the adjusted analyses, uh, again, there was no difference in the WIDEA FS score uh, at 12 months. 18 months or 24 months. We powered the study uh, for uh, non-inferiority and all of the analyses met the a priori non-inferiority limit of a half a standard deviation um, of the WIDEA FS score. We did some pre-specified subgroup analyses. We looked at our preterm babies and again found that the WIDEA FS score at 24 months corrected age was not different for babies who went home on versus off of anti-seizure medicines. And for babies with HIE, uh, again, no difference in functional development at 24 months. Importantly, the risk for epilepsy was also unchanged. Overall in the cohort, 13% of babies developed post neonatal epilepsy, and the median age of onset of epilepsy was seven months. Uh, the number, the absolute number was 11% in the group whose anti-seizure medicines were discontinued, and 14% in the babies whose anti-seizure medicines were maintained. Uh, the adjusted odds ratio was 1.5, but a very large confidence interval. I want to point out that every infant who had epilepsy at onset less than four months of age, which is the median duration for um, continuing phenobarbital in the babies who went home on medicines, uh, had their anti-seizure medicines maintained at the time of hospital discharge. So they developed epilepsy even though they were already on medicine. Again, I'll show you a survival curve here. This is the survival without epilepsy. Babies uh, who's had their medicines maintained are in the purple and discontinued in the gray. And again, pointing out that all of the babies who had epilepsy at onset less than four months were in the maintain group. Um, and I'll tell you some more about this in a minute, but about a third of the babies who developed epilepsy had infantile spasms. Let's talk a little bit more about the profile of post neonatal epilepsy. Um, about half of the babies had clearly focal epilepsy. At the last follow-up, half of the babies had already been seizure-free for more than six months. Uh, about a third had less than one seizure per month, but 11% had really relentless daily seizures. Of note, about a third of these babies already had treatment-resistant epilepsy by the time they were two years old. So that means that they had tried two appropriately selected anti-seizure medications, but continued to have, um, continued to have persistent seizures by the time they were two. And that did not include the medicines they received for their acute neonatal seizures. Another really important take home for me was the, the very high risk for abnormal development among the babies who had epilepsy. So 81% of the babies who developed postnatal epilepsy had a um, clear impaired functional development out outcome with a WIDEA FS score worse than two standard deviations when below the normal population mean. And that's compared with 27% of children who did not develop epilepsy. And that's even though half of the babies were seizure free for more than six months by the time they were two years old. So Developing postneonatal epilepsy should be a, a big marker of risk for abnormal development. When we looked at adjusted models to predict neonatal risk factors uh, to predict epilepsy, uh, there were no surprises here. Babies who had more seizures, um, so the number of days of neonatal EEG confirmed seizures um, was a, a risk factor for epilepsy, and babies who had an abnormal discharge neurologic exam also had a higher risk for seizures for postneonatal epilepsy.
I mentioned infantile spasms a minute ago, and I want to spend a few minutes just to highlight those. Um, infantile spasms were fortunately rare in this cohort, um, but they're really important because early diagnosis and treatment of infantile spasms offers the best hope of preserving development. In our cohort, this was 4% of the cohort, but it was about a third of the babies who went on to develop epilepsy. We did a separate analysis of risk factors for infantile spasms in these babies. And we found three important factors, one EEG, one MRI, and one clinical. So on EEG, a severely abnormal EEG background or more than three days of neonatal EEG confirmed seizures was a risk factor. A deep gray injury or brainstem injury on neonatal MRI and abnormal tone on discharge exam. And that was just marked as abnormal, whether it be low tone or high tone. And we, we extracted that from the medical records. What does that look like? Among babies who had none of these three risk factors, none of them developed infantile spasms. So they're a relatively low risk group. Babies who had one or two of these risk factors had the baseline risk for the, for the whole cohort. But babies who had all three of these risk factors, more than half of them developed infantile spasms. So a very high risk group. That's important both for counseling and for design of clinical trials that may be um, attempting to reduce the incidence of infantile spasms. So infantile spasms after acute neonatal seizures can be predicted based on these clinical factors. That's important because it's just three things that we can all remember and we can teach to parents. It's really important for parent education. If the baby has no risk factors, you can be very reassuring about infantile spasms. If the baby has all three, then that baby really requires careful monitoring. Parents need to be very carefully educated about what to look for, and there should be a low threshold for a follow-up with a neurologist and for a follow-up EEG. We developed this into the infographic seen on the right side of the screen. Uh, this graphic is available on the Neonatal Seizure Registry website, which I've listed below uh, in English and in Spanish. Please feel free to go to that website and to download this if you find it helpful. <clears throat> to just summarize here, epilepsy prediction after acute provoked neonatal seizures. Staying on an anti-seizure medicine isn't going to help prevent epilepsy. All of our very earliest onset epilepsies were in babies who went home on medicine. There are some babies who need extra close follow-up. Babies who have lots of neonatal seizures, three days or more. Uh, babies who have abnormal neural exam at discharge, babies who have brainstem injury. Um, if you're not able to do the imaging, one proxy is babies who do not take all oral feeds at the time of discharge from the hospital. And maybe also hemispheric in injury. And if you're interested, I can talk to you a bit more about that. But the, the follow-up EEG um, that we did at three months of age, the babies who had a clear hemispheric asymmetry uh, seem to be at a risk, a higher risk for epilepsy. So I wonder in my practice whether a follow-up EEG and exam by two months of age um, may be appropriate for high-risk infants to screen for hypsarrhythmia. I want to shift gears uh, for a few minutes before we finish um, to emphasize something that Dr. Curtin emphasized as well, that parent well-being is really key for child development and it's important for our babies with neonatal seizures. We uh, worked with our parent partners and with uh, Linda Frank at University of California, San Francisco uh, to look at associations between infant and par parent characteristics and measures of family well-being and parent well-being in newborns in the same cohort of newborns with seizures. Um, at the time of discharge from the neonatal intensive care unit, more than half of our parents had uh, significant symptoms of anxiety and about a third had depression or at least symptoms of depression. And those problems persisted over time. So this paper um, is just now coming out um, in the last week in children where we looked at um, measures that were validated measures of parent well-being at the time of hospital discharge, 12, 18, and 24 months. And what you can see here is that the risk for anxiety in the blue um, 
came down a little bit by 12 months of by the baby's 12, you know, first birthday, but it persisted. Uh, the risk for depression in the orange um, similarly came down, but still persisted at more than 10% of the parents. And the risk for uh, possible or probable post-traumatic stress disorder um, was in more than one quarter of our, of our family. So this is something that we really definitely need to be paying attention to. The bottom line here is that we have to care for the parent as well as the child. Uh, we asked parents to write to us and tell us what would be helpful for them and what advice they had for clinicians. And the themes that came out of this really beautiful analysis by Monica Levin at Duke University uh, included uh, the value of clear and consistent communication, having consensus within the hospital team, uh, and encouraging parents to participate in bedside care. Uh, even the ability to change the baby's diaper um, or feed them makes a difference for a family. We developed this infographic for parents, uh, which again is available uh, in English and Spanish on the neonatal seizure registry website uh, to help to uh, share with them that it is understandable and uh, recognize that anxiety and depression are common for our families and that there are some challenges. Uh, and also that many of our families shared uh, sources of strength. Uh, there are some uh, links on this infographic to relevant, reliable uh, peer support as well. Bedside communication really matters and that was highlighted um, by the parents who wrote to us um, both at the time of NICU um, discharge, but also later on uh, over the course of their child's first two years. Uh, they emphasized to us that it really is important that we learn to communicate effectively with parents and amongst ourselves, that we provide resources and support for the baby, but also for their families, and that we understand and validate the parent experience. Uh, and once again, this infographic is available on our website. So concluding this part about discontinuing anti-seizure medicines, um, I want you to take home from this talk that stopping medicines early after acute symptomatic neonatal seizures resolves would, you know, after a few days is safe. Um, it won't impair functional development. It won't increase the risk of epilepsy. And in fact, when we did some additional analyses, it seemed to be associated with improved parent well-being. And I would say then that there's no real rationale for continuing the medicine. Uh, there's no benefit to neurodevelopmental outcome for going home on medicine. It prolongs exposure to medicines that potentially have side effects. It won't delay the onset of epilepsy. In our cohort, the earliest onset epilepsies occurred in spite of maintaining medicines. And we know that for epilepsy with onset at less than 12 months, levetiracetam actually is better at controlling seizures than phenobarbital. This is different from the acute treatment of um, newly diagnosed neonatal seizures. Um, but so if, you're, if your baby does come back and develop epilepsy, um, there's a different medicine aside from phenobarbital that may work better. A third of early epilepsy is infantile spasms. And we know that infantile spasms do not respond to phenobarbital and levetiracetam. So overall, the evidence supports discontinuing anti-seizure medicines for most babies with acute symptomatic seizures prior to discharge from the hospital. If you're still nervous, I would encourage you to think about using MRI and genetic testing to exclude newborns with neonatal onset epilepsy and confirm their acute symptomatic etiology. To monitor, if at all possible, according to the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society guidelines to ensure that the seizures, those acute seizures really have resolved. Um, and to wait to stop the medicines until the clinical course for the baby is improving. So it doesn't mean you have to stop instantly, but that within a few days, you're probably okay to stop. And that there's no need or rationale to transition to a different medicine prior to discharge home. What we studied here was going home off of every medicine as compared with any medicine. So it's okay to just go home off of medicine. So to summarize for you, you know, I showed you that um, slide from the editorial from 2005 saying, you know, after all these years, we still love what doesn't work. Um, and that's a little depressing, but there are new developments in neonatal seizures. We talked about the fact that the ILAE underscores the role of EEG monitoring. I talked briefly about the importance of distinguishing acute symptomatic neonatal seizures from neonatal onset epilepsy. 
And that really key distinction that babies who have neonatal onset epilepsy very often have an identifiable genetic etiology. And those genetic etiologies sometimes have precision therapy options. That phenobarbital remains the first line medication for neonatal seizure treatment, but that early treatment discontinuation is safe. And parent well being is likely to influence children's outcomes. So we have a clear opportunity to screen for anxiety and depression and to offer resources to families at the time they go home from the neonatal intensive care unit. I'd like to thank again uh, my outstanding uh, collaborators with the neonatal seizure registry, um, fabulous stakeholders, uh, thank our funding resources and the wonderful clinical research coordinators at every site, as well as, of course, the children and their families. If you want more information about the work that we've done, please refer to the Neonatal Seizure Registry website uh, that I've listed below um, or send me a message. I'd be happy to talk with you. And I'm delighted to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, let me start my video. Okay. Um, thank you very much for an excellent uh, uh, talk. Um, your, your, your data on uh, the discontinuation of medication and the take home message is quite uh, striking in the revelation. And I'm sure will make us think hard when we're trying to prescribe uh, the anti seizure medications uh, for neonates at the time of discharge. Um, there are a few questions uh, which uh, uh, has come. And first one is, what's your advice for the management of neonates where EEG is not readily available? Because there'll be quite a few situations in resource limited settings where, um, what would be your advice on that? Right, um, thank you. And, and I realize that I come from a place where I'm completely spoiled and we have EEG monitoring available whenever we want it. I also think that it's very important that our um, Research does use EEG confirmation to make sure that the, the data we are uh, reporting out really are about babies who had true seizures. Um, if you don't have EEG monitoring available or amplitude integrated EEG monitoring available, um, then you're looking for clinically apparent signs of a baby who's encephalopathic, um, has a known or suspected acute brain injury, and has abnormal consistent patterns of abnormal movements. Um, I mentioned to you that our babies who had neonatal onset epilepsy uh, were the most often, uh, were most often going to have tonic seizures. And so that's a really important um, sign for you to look for, for focal tonic seizures. And then the last thing I would mention on this is that um, because of immature myelination, um, newborns don't have generalized onset seizures. So if a baby in front of you is having movements that really appeared bilateral generalized from the beginning. It may well be that that's posturing or another abnormal movement, but that is not seizure uh, because neonatal seizures are focal in origin. Thank you. Um, another question about, I think you mentioned uh, in, 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 your, in your talk uh, that if the child, if the baby remains seizure free for a few days, uh, then you're safe to stop. And mm -hmm. uh, the next question from one of them, is um, uh, along those lines as in acute symptomatic seizures, how long should the neonated be seizure free um, before we start tapering the anticonvulsants? And do we need to do an EEG before stopping the drug? Good question. Um, so in our study, the median um, exposure was six days um, in the babies who went home off of anti-seizure medicines. Um, so if you think about a baby who was cooled, that was our most common etiology was HIE. They were cooled and they rewarmed on day four, um, and then the medicine was continued for a couple more days. The baby started to look better, and then the medicine was stopped. Um, phenobarbital has a very long half-life, and so there's no need to wean that medicine when it's been only used for a few days um, or even a, a week or two. Uh, you can simply stop it, and the level will gradually decline naturally, so you don't need to taper it. Again, something along, uh, you mentioned initially that the events without EEG evidence are not seizures. Uh, um, and uh, again, along something, a question along those lines, uh, where if a baby is having an abnormal neurological examination, but a normal EEG, um, what, what do we do? 
Uh, Good question. Um, so if your baby has an abnormal exam and has EEG running and has their event that you're concerned about, but there's no EEG correlate, that event doesn't necessarily mean that that event is normal, but it wasn't a seizure and anti-seizure medicines are not going to stop those from happening. And so um, I think it's very important to distinguish if, you're, if your baby has clinical events that have, and you have EEG running, there's no change on the EEG, those aren't seizures. And so we need to perhaps look at, do they have a movement disorder? Do they have uh, epistotonic posturing? Do they have reflux? What else is going on that, that maybe is making that baby move abnormally? And another question on, um, uh, what's your opinion on the use of lignocaine as a first line anti-seizure medication? One of the first questions. Um, good question. So um, lidocaine, I will say in the United States, there are very few people who use it. Um, our center does have it, it's part of our protocols. Um, however, most babies will have seizures stop with their loading doses of phenobarbital, um, if you look at all comers. And so to me, it makes sense to give a, a less morbid um, medicine first, um, because if the seizures go away, then you're done. Um, I, however, if you've given several loading doses of phenobarbital, uh, and a baby is still having very frequent seizures, I think there's definitely a role for um, lidocaine um, as a next step if you have the appropriate monitoring available. The next question is on um, starting the anticonvulsants uh, where um, one of them asks, bearing in mind that most seizures are subclinical, is it necessary to have an abnormal EEG to start anticonvulsant treatment? Because sometimes they may not be available, uh, you know, the EEG monitoring may not be available. Um, so we want to be careful that we're treating seizures and not something else. Um, and I would not advocate for prophylactic anti-seizure medicine for every baby who has risk, um, but I would want additional confirmatory evidence um, if at all possible. Um, whether that evidence be your clinical exam and their abnormal paroxysmal movements um, or an EEG or AEG, whatever you have available. Um, and I would refer you back to the ILAE paper from 2021 in epilepsia, which has some more information about how confident you may or may not be with, uh, without EEG available, um, depending on the clinical scenario. Another uh, person has asked a question on the <clears throat> interaction between phenobarbital and caffeine. So does the use of phenobarbital interfere with the effect of caffeine or can the caffeine interfere with the effect of phenobarbital? That's a very good question. And I don't, I don't know the answer. I, I don't think I've ever seen there be a clinically important interaction, um, but I don't know the pharmacology based on that. I see Dr. Mather doing this. So I'm hoping he agrees with me. <laughs> And, and, and infantil, and another person, um, I'm just trying to read here, infantil spasm prediction tool is an externally validated tool or applicable in level four setups only as most of the centers in, uh, are not able to get a, an amplitude integrated EEG. So it looks like more as a, as a comment. Do you have any? Um, uh, yeah, so this, uh, this prediction tool was done across the nine centers at the, or seven centers actually, at the neonatal seizure registry. Um, we haven't done a second um, validation study, although we're working to get data to do that. Um, so you can, you can take that for, for what it's worth. I think the, the results are really interesting. I think they're intuitively appropriate um, and, and do seem to identify our babies who are going to be at high risk who need, who need careful follow-up. You mentioned uh, in a very important area of, you know, the families requiring uh, quite a lot of support, especially in, 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 in these in babies with these. So do you, do you refer them to psychologists is one of the questions that uh, is asked by one of the audience. Uh, that's a really good question. I think there are lots of different approaches. And again, resources are variable. Um, I think it is clear that at the time that we're making diagnoses and treating babies for seizures, we need to be looking at parents. And um, as, as Dr. Curtin emphasized, um, if it's not their fault, they need to hear it loud and clear, it's not their fault. Um, and to normalize uh, the truth that many or most parents who go through this really traumatic um, experience 
have anxiety, depression, and may develop PTSD, and that that's that's not something to be ashamed of, um, and that there are resources available, I think is really important. And what resources are available are going to vary, you know, from, you know, my town to the next town over. Um, so knowing what your local resources are uh, is also important. Um, here in my institution, we have a social worker who will see all of our, our families and, and can help us to try to guide. Um, but I also am very spoiled in that many of our families follow with obstetrics right in my institution. And so we can reach out easily to their obstetricians or primary care providers as well um, to help guide um, counseling. The other thing that is available for everybody if they have access to the internet is um, online parent support groups. And there are some really outstanding examples. Um, Hand to Hold is a great uh, resource for families of babies who have been in the NICU regardless of their um, diagnosis. Uh, Hope for HIE does really outstanding outreach um, for families who are experiencing HIE for their babies. So I think looking to uh, appropriate family support online um, can really help to break down some of the barriers to access to longer term support and connection. Um, another person asks, so, um, is there a role for car, car Asphyxia. I'm very sorry. There was a glitch in the internet, and I didn't hear your question. Could you repeat it? Sure. It's my my internet is playing up. It, I, one person asked, "What's the role of carbamazepine in epilepsy that develops after a neonatal seizure?" Great question. And um, so there are um, several case reports or case series of using carbamazepine for neonatal onset epilepsies. Uh, carbamazepine seems to be quite effective for babies who have potassium channel related epilepsies, KCNQ2, for example, KCN, KCNQ3. Um, and so that is definitely a go-to medicine for um, babies with neonatal onset epilepsy. Um, for infants who develop focal epilepsy, um, carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine uh, may certainly have a role. Um, the data that I have personally analyzed, we had fewer babies with um, oxcarbazepine or carbamazepine in our sample, so we couldn't have a really robust statistical analysis as compared with levetiracetam. Um, the main question for infants past the neonatal period is what is their etiology and do they really have focal epilepsy or do they have mixed or generalized epilepsy? Um, if they have mixed or generalized epilepsy, carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine may actually make things worse. And so, um, if you're not sure, I think levetiracetam is a reasonable choice because it has a broad spectrum of um, action and effect, again, for post-neonatal epilepsy, not for neonatal seizures, but for babies if they develop epilepsy later. Another person asks, do you recommend anti-seizure treatment for hypoglycemic seizures? Uh, if it's really just hypoglycemia, fix the sugar um, and then see how the baby does. Um, there are certainly some babies who have severe hypoglycemia and have really obvious brain injury if you do the imaging, um, and they may need more treatment, but the first step should be to fix the, the glucose. And are there any um, EEG patterns um, uh, of seizures that uh, might give a clue towards whether you can discontinue or continue anti-seizure medications? Good question. So in our um, statistical models, we looked at EEG patterns and, and we did both um, descriptions of the EEG from the clinical reports as well as central review of the broad tracing. And it didn't matter, that's the bottom line, um, that the, the, risk, um, the risk of developing abnormal um, functional development or epilepsy was not different whether the baby went home on or off medicine. Having a very abnormal EEG is certainly a risk factor for abnormal outcomes. So don't, don't hear me wrong there, but whether they go home on or off of medicine doesn't change that. As you can imagine, there are plenty of questions and uh, I would request if uh, you're able to answer them sure on thing. that. 